good to see you today. I'm thinking about a little gal, Lacey. She's, oh, maybe early 20s or so, and she loves to teach um, a kid's Sunday school class. She's been doing this now maybe a couple of years or so. And so that meant every Saturday she spends, you know, an hour or two getting ready. You know, little songs to sing and, you know, uh, things to cut out so they can take home after they've colored it and use some illustrations. So, you know, she's really thought this through. So she uh, gets to church one Sunday morning and and has her class there. And she says to her children, hey, um, what's gray, has a big bushy tail, has four little paws, he climbs trees and sometimes he eats nuts. She thinks this is a no-brainer, right? And they sit there, kind of stunned, and, you know, like, no, nothing, no talking. And she thinks, okay, well, maybe I just need to say it a little louder, you know? So, kids, what's gray, has a bushy tail, climbs in trees, eats nuts with his little paws, dead silence. She's thinking, this is puzzling. <laughs> Now what? So maybe I need to talk louder, go longer, get more details, whatever. So she starts over. Now kids, imagine you're at the park, and there's big trees there, and there are these little tiny animals, and they have have kind of a white chest, they have gray fur, and they jump back and forth from tree to tree, and they eat, you know, they eat acorns, and it's quiet again, and pretty soon, little Johnny, little tiny Johnny, timidly raises his hand, and she said, she's like, oh, thank goodness, somebody's going to say something, but she goes, well, Johnny, you know, what do you think is the answer? And he said, Miss Lacey, it sounds like a squirrel, but I think I'm supposed to say Jesus. And maybe Johnny's right. I mean, you know, it, life often sounds like about, it's about something else. And really, it's all about Jesus. This series that we just began in the book of Mark is all about Jesus. As Pastor Mike explained last week, um, Jesus came to earth to usher in a new kingdom and to reintroduce God. He wanted to write a new covenant, a new way of knowing and living with God. And it's all about Jesus. And Jesus wanted us to know the good news. And the good news is that God is with us, and God is for us. And truly, it was the good news, the best news ever, because through the years, and there had been about 400 years, we're told that really God was pretty silent. And so the people had come to believe really some mixed up ideas and things about who God is. Some of those messed up ideas they learned from their parents. I mean, we do that to our kids. And sometimes religious leaders and some from pure guesswork. This happens, so this must be that. That's why he is. Okay, so guesswork and sometimes just from sitting around the campfire with the buddies. But God had been misunderstood. By the time Jesus arrived, they weren't really sure that God cared one bit about them. Maybe he had forgotten them, or maybe he was angry at them, or maybe he was just disgusted with them. But then Jesus began to preach. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Did you notice the word repent? Uh, It always jumps out at me. I don't know if it's because it's calling us to do something and to feel a certain way. But it does usually, when we hear that word, we think repent means to be sorrowful and to turn away from something. But the Greek word that's used here is metanoia. And it has two parts, which I just love this. Meta, in its simplest form, means change. But the richer definition means to expand, be open to something at a deeper level of reality. The second part of the word is noia, which, and it is derived from the Greek word nois, which is translated as mind or heart or consciousness. The word that Jesus used here then, metanoia, although often translated in an easier form as repent, has a more nuanced meaning of 
change or transform the way that you think. See with your heart. So yes, Jesus is saying, repent. And he's saying, look at life differently. Look at it closely. He was calling his people to see something besides 600 plus laws of fine print that had to be, that had to be established to create a new nation. And he wants to rewrite that covenant that says, I will do this if you will do that. Jesus is saying, watch me, hear me, see me. Don't just look at the Father through the same old lens that you've always used. Use me as the lens. It is time for metanoia, a new and deeper faith. He's calling us to see with the eyes of our hearts. I believe that Jesus, through his teaching and his actions, is showing us that God is much kinder, much more compassionate toward us than we ever imagined him to be. He is calling us to a new and better way of loving him. You know, we're going to be looking at two or three chapters every week for this whole series, and they are jam-packed. And so what I'm going to do today, and this is going to, you'll, you'll see this as we start in, but it's going to be like me taking a rock and skipping it, you know, across the water. And it's not going to go deep, fast, it's going to, we're going to hit some high points, but I think what we're confident of is that in your own, your own Bible study time, and then when you meet with your community groups, that you'll have time to go deeper and to talk in a, in a more, um, a, deep, a deeper way that will mean very, very meaningful to you. But today we pick up our narrative in chapter 4 of Mark. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd had gathered around him and was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So right out of the gate in chapter 4, we are introduced to the teaching style of Jesus. He was a master teacher, and he had two particular ways that he taught. Jesus is saying, um, watch me, and the way that he, he's going, and he's also going teaching parables. Now, he talked about his kingdom, and he talked about God using parables that were short stories in the here and now to lead us to a there and then. He would use a familiar sight, like a mustard tree, and he would use it to describe a spiritual truth. Parables weren't written sermons that were practiced and perfected, but, his spo but spontaneous stories told on the spur of the moment, sitting on the, sitting on the side of the hill or sitting in a boat somewhere. These parables would have made sense to the first century uh, believers. Typically, there was one big idea in a, a parable, not layer upon layer, uh, layers of meanings. Oftentimes, you know, when we look at parables today, we're like, oh, there's got to be more here and two or three things. And really, they were designed to be a one-pointer. I mean, you know, here's the big idea. And lastly, and probably the most important and valuable part of the parable, is that it pushes a person to think for himself. It urged those in the crowd to make deductions and to discover the truth for himself. You know, if you have a child you're trying to teach arithmetic, you don't go, hey, why don't you go play and I'll do, the, I'll do your homework tonight. You want them to do the homework, to do the thinking, to do the practice. And that's what Jesus wanted his listeners to do, to be active, to discover truth and make it their own. So we see throughout our reading that Jesus is not setting up a whole bunch of new rules, but he's calling people to understand, to see with their hearts, to love a God they've never really known before. And the one way he did that was by using parables. Now, the second other and the other primary way that Jesus taught was by what he did, the way that he lived he wanted them to see that he didn't seem to mind being interrupted, although he seemed to always be busy, right? He wanted them to see what life looked like when you needed to reset and recharge. He wanted to confront wrong thinking, but he didn't want to condemn people as he did it. So he showed us how he did that. He wanted them to see the way that he could command the natural world to submit 
and that he loved people who were hurting and distressed with great compassion. Truly, just like the little boy in the Sunday school class, it's all about Jesus. And so we need to hear what he has to teach us, and we need to watch the way he does life. We need to see God with a new set of eyes. In these chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, Mark records just a sampling of his verbal teaching, but mostly he records his actions, the things he was doing. So after a full day of teaching parables, as the evening approached, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? This must have been some wicked storm, because we know that at least four of the disciples were fishermen. So they had lived their whole lives on the sea. They had been through many squalls. But these guys were obviously afraid for their lives. But Jesus got up, and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the, wa- the wind died down. And in the message it reads, The wind ran out of breath. And it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Jesus had already done numerous miracles, and they didn't completely understand his power yet. And I don't think he was mad about this. I mean, I don't think he was ticked off at them, but like a good teacher, he's going to keep asking questions, pushing them to articulate what they really want, what they they really believe, what they need. The last verse of that section reads, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Jesus, by his actions, is teaching that he is the one who saves. He who set the seas in place is still the one who commands them at his choosing. He is all-powerful, and he is capable of commanding the storms any storm. In Mark 5, 1 through 9, we read, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, the man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of that area. So right on the tail end of that crazy, scary sea event, Jesus and his disciples pull their boats up onto shore in Gentile territory, and a man greets them who is absolutely out of his ever-loving mind. He is completely broken. He is crazed, uncontrollable. He's screaming. He's filthy and bleeding. Can you imagine it? The disciples have been through this terrifying experience, and now this guy greets them in the dusk of night. I I mean, when I'm thinking of this, my heart starts to race, and I think, this is seriously like the movie Exorcist, but on steroids. It's spooky, right? But still, true to his nature, Jesus looks at the man, he talks to the man, he asks the man questions to bring clarity to the man's desires, and then he sets him free. 
He commands that which was evil, that which was torturing his soul and ravaging his mind, to be gone. And with that command, Jesus is inviting the outcast and the tormented into a new kingdom, a kingdom where Jesus will set captives free, where he will love any person, broken, possessed, messy, and hopeless. Jesus has the power to do a work that no one else can do. It's all about Jesus. All of it. He knows our demons, and he will demand their departure. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He knows you, and he knows me. There is an entire rest of the story that follows this, and it, this is when we're skipping again, you know, the rock is skipping over the water, and it describes how Jesus is asked to leave this region, despite the fact that there's just been this huge miracle. The, the townspeople are a little, like, um, disturbed by his action there, and so they ask him to leave. So Jesus gets back in his boat. That's that same boat, right, that he's just come over the sea, and it's stormy. Now he's going to get back in that boat, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Jesus is teaching as the crowds are pushing against him. And this powerful man, perhaps the most important and powerful person of this region, came in search of Jesus. As the ruler of the synagogue, so great was the people's respect and maybe fear of him that the crowds would have parted as he approached. No matter who it was, every person, though, in that vicinity could feel the man's desperation. He fell to his knees and he begs God to heal his 12-year-old daughter. With her sickness, his pride is completely forgotten. He doesn't care if he looks like an idiot or that he's needy. He no longer cares about his position or his reputation or his former friends and colleagues. He knows he needs a touch from God. He needs the healing that only God can bring. So he falls to his knees. He humbles himself to beg Jesus to heal his daughter. I so appreciate that Jesus doesn't use this moment as a quote-unquote teaching moment to teach this guy a lesson, um, you know, to say something like, oh, now you need me, now you want a miracle. Okay, good, now I'm good enough to come to your house. After all, the religious leaders of this time are already feeling threatened by Jesus, by this rabbi, and they, they are shortly, if aren't already feeling this way, he, that he's the enemy. And they're going to create lies, and they're going to find ways to trap him and, and, or try to trap him. And eventually, of course, um, they will set in motion a whole series of events to kill him. But Jesus didn't know that, or he didn't do that. He knew that was coming. He didn't, he didn't take a teaching moment to uh, criticize him, be catty. That's kind of a girl's term, but catty. And Mark writes these simple words, and I love this. So Jesus went with him. Later in the text, we're told that that little girl does die and, um, while Jesus is on his way, but he, he eventually gets there. He touches her. He's gone into a room. He touches her, and he tells her to get up, and she comes back to life. She is restored again. And in this story, Jesus is demonstrating that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing, and that he is, and he's teaching by his actions that he's all-loving. He cares for each person, no matter where they are, that he will extend grace to the rich and the poor, the learned and the ignorant, the religious pious and the godless cynic. He is teaching by his actions that Jesus is always willing to go 
where he's been invited and where healing is sought. While Jesus was on his way to heal the young dying girl, he encounters a desperate, uh, desperate and poor outcast of a woman. In verse 25, and a woman was there who had been sub subject to bleeding for 12 years. Here we see a woman who in this culture was considered a lesser human being simply because of her gender. And then on top of it, she was sick, which most, most people in this society would have considered this God's judgment for something she had done in her past. So she was not only embarrassed, but she would have been relegated to the fringes of society because of her illness. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. This is a woman that's at the end of her rope. Nothing and no one had been able to help her. Not only um, did she not find relief, but it is said she continued to get worse. And if you've ever experienced chronic pain, you know how this woman was feeling. It is a despairing place. It is a hopeless place. It is a dark place of loneliness. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And because of this stigma associated with disease and illness, the woman risked ridicule to even be there. Maybe even possibly they would be cruel to her because she was in their midst. And so instead of trying to talk to him, she simply hoped that if she could touch him, she could maybe be healed. So immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, "'Who touched my clothes?' Well, you see people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? They're incredulous. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it, and then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. As I read this story, I am overwhelmed with gratefulness because Jesus took time to notice her. He knew someone had touched him despite the crowd. Jesus knew she was there, and he was not going to let her remain invisible. He could have just moved on after all there was this like huge crowd. Everybody's pushing in on him, needing him, touching him, and he's already on his way to save somebody, so he's busy enough. But instead of feeling bothered and irritated by this interruption, he took a moment to look for the woman. And as the text says, she too came and fell at his feet. She told him the whole truth. And I, I, what I love most is that, that Jesus took the time to heal, hear her whole story. Who knew that the God of the universe wants to hear our whole story? I'm amazed again at the text. She trembles, and he responds to this outcast, this woman, this woman that is sick, daughter, which was a term of endearment. Your faith, be it tiny, tiny, healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. As Jesus walked the dusty roads of Israel, he was talking to people. He was listening to their stories. He is calling them. He was introducing them to a new kingdom and a new way of who God was and is. He wanted them to see what he is like, that he's all, power, that, all powerful, that even the seas obey his word, that he's all knowing, that he knows the life that we live, the demons that we fight. And here in these two intertwined stories, we see that Jesus is all kind. He is merciful, gracious, and that he cares about our story. 
where we've been. Jesus was a master teacher. And Jesus, throughout the Gospels, is teaching that this is an upside-down kingdom. That it isn't about doing all the right things. And it isn't about living this perfect, spit-shine life. Instead, Jesus is inviting the broken down, the bullied, the beat up, and the one who is desperate enough to come. Jesus is inviting us to repent. Indeed, he is. To see with our hearts. To experience the good and beautiful life that he is establishing. In every one of these stories, we see Jesus inviting us to leave our old thoughts about God behind. The ideas that God's unconcerned with us or he's repelled by us or that inst and instead he is inviting us to enter into a new place of hope and healing of our minds and our souls. I wonder if there's someone here today who feels as if the circumstances of their lives are out of control. And maybe you need to experience God's power to calm a storm. Or maybe there's someone who needs to see the kindness in Jesus' eyes. Someone maybe that needs to feel a healing touch from God. Maybe there's someone here who's crying for a child because they're dying spiritually, emotionally, maybe even relationally. Maybe there's someone who can relate to the crazed man and you feel a little bit haunted by those demons of your past. And maybe there's someone who is like the sick woman and you're just exhausted and you're depleted of joy. I can't help but notice that one of the common denominators in each of these stories with each of these people is they took a step, they sought Jesus. They took a step toward Jesus. They made a move toward him. Even in their fear, they set aside their pride. And in every one of these, they fell at his feet. As the team comes to close, I want to invite you to take a step toward Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And he's the one who can change your life. You know, I know that you can sit right where you are and take a step toward Jesus. Because this is really about the posture of our hearts. But there is something very courageous and powerful about moving our physical bodies to follow our hearts. So I'm going to encourage you today, I'm going to invite you today to come forward, to pray here, to take a step and go move toward Jesus. Because once you get an idea of who he is, you can't help but move. You can't help but reach out and try and touch him. He was a healer, and he wants to heal us.